Of course. As Chris said, if you've got a question, then uh, raise your hand. And fire away. Yeah. Hi, uh, Steve Craig, Las Vegas Wire. Uh, I know that you're kind of young in your cast in Return of the Jedi, and I just wondered if you had any acting experience before that, or if you had studied or been in anything prior. Well, um, growing up as a, as, as a little person, um, you tend, uh, as a child certainly, to develop um, a rather sort of larger than life personality to make up for your lack of inches, uh, so that you know within crowds of friends, etc., you're still noticed and not just sort of left out. So I had a very big personality, was was quite the entertainer uh, in, in social circles, and um, and so that that kind of lends itself quite well to performing. Um, but I, I didn't do any sort of formal training or anything like that. You know, literally. You know, being given the opportunity to be in Return of the Jedi was my sort of springboard into this, this world of acting. Um, and, you know, in, in doing that film, I kind of found that I really enjoyed it. And, and um, you know, George Lucas and Richard Mark, one the director, had spotted in me some sort of potential talent as well. Um, and then, you know, I was fortunate to be given other opportunities after Star Wars to carry on doing, uh, doing acting. Uh, and, uh, it was sort of later on in my teenage years I realised that it was something that I really wanted to do as a career. Prior to that, it had been just really fun, and you know, I had the opportunity to, to fly to America and uh, hang out in nice hotels and, and do filming, you know, and, and that to me as a kid was really, really fun. Because you you've really developed. I mean, you're still doing things. You're very prominent and yeah. working with Ricky Gervais and all that. So I, I just wondered, is there anything that took place maybe after Return of the Jedi till now? as far as classes, or was it just kind of on-set learning as you go along? You know, you learn, I think, on the job, really. I mean, that, that's the best way to learn. I mean, I'm, I've, I've been lucky to work with some of the best actors in the world, so sitting on set, as you do for many hours, because most of acting on a film is certainly about sitting and waiting uh, to do anything, and, uh, and so sitting there just kind of watching other people work and, and working with, with these great actors over the years, you just, you just pick up little things and techniques and... You, you watch your own work, which I do, and you realise what works and what doesn't work. And, and, and some of the things I do is quite specialised, you know, working in prosthetic makeups and things. So you certainly have to watch those, and you certainly learn every time you do something. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's about watching and learning, and, and you just, um, I just have a natural kind of... I think, I think I, as long as I'm enjoying it, you know, I think as an actor, if you're, if you're enjoying what you do, and, and I'm so lucky to have a job that I love, you know, I mean, it's... Uh, I could think of nothing worse than having to go to work just to earn money, you know, and not actually enjoying what you do. And so, it's, I'm really lucky to still be enjoying this. And uh, you know, I can't believe it. it's been over 30 years, and, and I'm still, I'm still acting, and the work is still there. And I'm, I'm very fortunate because you know, there's a lot of actors who have to just take on many other jobs just to support themselves while they follow their, their passion. But uh, I'm really lucky. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Carlos Peroni, Chris Reyes. Uh, as a youngster while you were shooting Jedi, um, how many hours did you work while you were young? And did you have an on-set uh, teacher or tutor or something? Yeah, um, as, a, as a kid on a film, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult because you're only allowed to work um, 
I think it was six hours a day. Mm. Um, could have even been four back then. Uh, and um, and I do remember being on Star Wars, you know, and you're in an exciting action sequence, you know, you're you're playing the stormtroopers, there's some cool explosions going on and stuff, and then you'll get sort of literally, you know, there's not kind of another couple of minutes spare. It literally, as soon as the clock strikes, you leave the set. Whatever point that they're at with the filming, you as a youngster will will be will be taken up from the set and put into a classroom basically. So uh, I will say one minute I was battling stormtroopers, then I'm sort of wrestling with a maths equation, you know, it was, it was literally from one thing to the next. Uh, the on-set tutor we had on uh, Return of the Jedi, he was great, his name was Ray, and uh, he, he had a little classroom up in the Redwood Forest, with a little cabin that we used to go into. Uh, but he would do things like we would raise little chicks and things, and we would go on the walks through the forest and learn about the flora and fauna and, and the trees and everything else. And uh, it, was, uh, it was really quite interesting and very different education than I would have got back home in England. But, um, you know, growing up doing films and having tutors, I've probably benefited because you get one-on-one -on -one teaching as opposed to being in a classroom of 40 students. So uh, I, think, uh, I think it was great. And there's no better thing for a youngster than life experiences. Uh, you know, when, when we can and when it doesn't interrupt with school, I travel with my kids as much as possible because seeing the world learning about the world and other people, other cultures, etc. Um, you know, I think that's, it's sort of life enhancing, isn't it? And it gives them a lot of choices, you know, when you're growing up, then you know more about the world and it, you, it broadens your choices of what you want to do and, and where you might want to travel in the future as well. Cool. Yes. Hi, Steve Boss with Geek Fest Rants. Have your children expressed any interest in, uh, have they, or have they expressed any interest in, is that something that, uh, that might have encouraged. They, they have expressed interest in acting. They've actually um, uh, made their on-screen debut uh, in, in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. Um, they, both Annabelle and Harrison played goblins in the film. Uh, if you watch the film carefully, the opening shot of Gringotts, there's a wide shot of the bank uh, the first time we go into it. and uh, You'll just see Annabelle and Harrison pulling a little cart full of gold across the middle of the floor. Uh, but it was, uh, yeah, it was a good day that. It was actually quite interesting because as Grip Hook that day, I was invisible. So I was there to read dialogue, but I didn't have to be in all my makeup. So I was able to spend time with Annabelle Harrison, sort of helping them with their makeup. With their, so they had full on masks instead of full prosthetics. Um, and uh, so I was able to kind of help them sort of manage to do what they were doing. Because goblins have these shoes that are this long. So, so Harrison, he's tiny, he was like walking with these shoes that almost were as tall as he was. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, he likes to boast now that he was younger when he made his on-screen debut than I was. Mm -hmm. I think he was seven, or even six actually, and I was 11. Um, so he enjoys uh, teasing me with that. Uh, and they were both also in Jack the Giant Killer, which is uh, next year as well. So, uh, so yeah, then Harrison's already done two films before he was, before he was like the age that I started. Yeah. Uh, life's too short. How weird was it to play yourself, but not really play yourself? Um, it was quite liberating, actually. Uh, I treated the, the Warwick Davis in Life's Too Short as a character, as I would have any other character in film or TV uh, uh, shoot. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good because I got to do and say things that my normal kind of politeness stops me doing. And uh, he was a really fun character to play, that exaggerated version uh, of myself. and. You know, he thinks he's he's brilliant, you know, and, and, it, and gets to wear shades and ride around and ride around on a Segway. But they've come to think of it, and that's exactly what I've been doing here. Um, so it's it's kind of rubbing off on me a bit. But uh, but it was really really yeah, as I said, liberating um, just to, to do and say those things that you wouldn't normally do. Uh, and he's a he's a character that I you kind of sympathise with even when you're playing him. You like you know getting into these situations and you know, if you look at the broader spectrum, the broader kind of picture, you realise that it's, it's kind of not his fault, he just ends up trying too hard and, and it always backfires. And I mean the documentary there with him makes it all the worse, you know, because it's, it's on film and preserved for everyone to see forever, you know. But uh, we'll be doing a special next February um, for HBO, which is great. I've, uh, the script is really, really good, I'm really happy with it. And, uh, I'd love to tell you all about it, but I can't. But it's it's a really, really great sort of continuation of uh, of where things left off. Jeff Walmart, Hollywood. Um, I was wondering 
how the television experience that you had with Ricky, different things like that, compares to your film work. Is television something that you know you would do more of? Um, as, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not something I say I'm making a particular choice because I love acting, so to be given the opportunity to do it, however it may be, is, is what I enjoy. Um, but shooting Last Too Short was, was quite different to anything I'd done. Um, firstly, I was in it a lot more than anything I'd done in recent times. I mean, I was in every scene uh, and the amount of dialogue that we were getting through in a day because Ricky and Stephen shoot very, very quickly. We'll normally finish by about 3 p.m. Uh, in a day, so we start at 8, 9, 3, done. Whereas on a normal film, you might work from sort of 7 in the morning through till 8 o'clock at night uh, and, and move at a much slower pace. But we were getting through 10 pages of script a day. So just learning the amount I had to learn and keep up with it, otherwise if I got behind, you know, it would be a disaster. So I had to, to you know, every waking minute for six weeks, I was learning the scripts and, and living life too short. It was that intensive. And doing comedy as well is, is a lot different to drama uh, because it's, it's actually a lot more difficult because it, every little nuance and, and every slight alteration in the way you might deliver a line makes a difference to whether it's funny or not funny or you know, where, it, where it sits. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was, I worked very, very hard on that just to make it the best it could be. Um, although that said, you know, being on a set with Ricky and Steve is a lot of fun. You know, it's, uh, Ricky's a bit like a six-year-old sometimes. He's, <laughs> he has a lot of fun and just messes about, and then he'll focus in. And, and they're both such a brilliant team of directors because they don't give you the same direction. You know, Stephen will say a comment, and Ricky's comment will just enhance that, or they're never in conflict with each other. And, of course, having written it, they know the material so well. And, uh, so it was always a pleasure just doing those little monologue scenes, you know, where I have the talking heads just to so brilliantly realised and written, uh, you know, it's so, so great to perform. Um, so yeah, it was, it was the, one of the hardest things I've ever done, but, but I'm, I'm probably one of the things I'm most proud of. Yes? How hard was it to get to that scene with Liam Neeson? Extremely difficult, actually. Uh, that scene with Liam actually uh, has produced the most outtakes, probably 50% of the outtakes of the whole set of outtakes. Um, it was just... It was either Ricky laughing, Liam laughing, or me laughing. It was just so funny. He would just sit down with such earnest. That was what was funny about it. Was he sat down with such determination, and then started saying all this stuff, and that's what made it funny. You know, he um, he was brilliant, and, and you know, we improved a bit. All that stuff about hi, oh, yeah, I worked with you on episode one. Do you remember? And he goes, okay, and just carries on. It was just like. He was like, well, what we found with the, with the guest stars that came in, they would always be terribly apologetic as well. You know, like Liam felt particularly bad about the way he was treating me and, and things, you know, saying that. Um, so, yeah, he was, he was, he's such a lovely person anyway, and just to come in and do that. And, and we would always be quite nervous the day we had somebody coming in, like Liam or Johnny Depp or what have you. You know, there was a slight air of tension uh, around the crew. And... Uh, but when they came in, we actually discovered they were probably more nervous than we were about the whole thing, because they were coming into a whole new thing. Uh, you know, for Liam, certainly, he was out of his comfort zone doing comedy, and, and, uh, and so, yeah, they, they, they were sort of wanting to be put at ease uh, by all of us. And uh, I remember the day with Johnny Depp was actually our last day of filming to kind of pin him down for, for shooting. It was quite difficult, because he was working on his, his film, uh, the, the vampire film, at the same time. And, uh, it was the very, very last day uh, of filming, and uh, we thought we'd have him for maybe an hour or two to sort of get these scenes done. But he spent the whole day with us. I mean, just, come on, let's do it again, let's try something else. And, and you never quite knew what he was going to do, actually. And if you watch um, the scene in the office where he talks about Tim Allen, and the very end of it, he gets in a mood, because I, I laugh at, about how long Pirates of the Caribbean was, and um, he kicks the trash can, which was in the script, and then he walks up and tips a bowl of fruit over, like that. That wasn't, that was something he did. But on tapes before that, he would do anything. You never knew what was going to happen. He, um, he picked up fruit and started throwing it. I mean, and I'm not just saying acting throwing. He was really throwing I had to get on the floor under the chair. Ricky and Stephen got covered in, like, exploded banana. Um, they broke a win he broke a window with an apple behind them. And if you look at the, the edit as is, you see that Ricky, as... as uh, 
Johnny leaves, Ricky's sitting there going like that with his hand, because he is covered in banana, but they didn't use the, the, the take where you see the banana explode, but there's banana everywhere. Um, so uh, <laughs> that was what was good about him. And then in, in the hotel room with Johnny, I, I didn't know what he was going to do next. He had me on the bed, pinned down at one point, uh, asking to kiss me, asking <laughs> me to kiss him. I mean, he just didn't know what was going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so yeah, it was very, very funny. It was a bit, in the, in the scene where he's, he's asking me to reenact Rumpelstiltskin emergence from a sewer <laughs> and uh, he's, we're using a toilet to do that very thing. That was an actual hotel room uh, and an actual toilet and as we were doing, we were about to do a take, he leaned over and he said, uh, he said you know I've stayed in this room before and you wouldn't believe what happened on that toilet. And I was like, as I'm in the toilet and I'm like, oh thank you. <laughs> so, uh, and I was thinking, I mean, I'm in that toilet, it was a weird day that you have these out of body experiences where you kind of you sort of, in your mind, you hover up to the corner of the room and look at the scene. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm in a toilet, working on something with Ricky Gervais, with, with Johnny Depp here. Is this, is this a kind of good moment in my career or not? You know, well, where, where are we with this? You know, what would George Lucas say about this? <laughs> he started me in my career and this is where I've ended up. So, uh, so yeah, I hope that was my career going down the toilet. But, but, uh, just me. <laughs> you guys one more? Yes. Uh, how familiar were you with the Star Wars saga before you got the Jedi, or is that something you appreciated more afterwards? Uh, I was very familiar with it. Um, I was uh, when I did Jedi, I was eleven, so I, I was seven when Star Wars came out, and I distinctly remember going to the movie theatre to see the film uh, with a friend of mine, um, standing in line, uh, just in a in a cinema in a place called Sutton, just to the south of London, and uh, lining up there. And uh, I remember all the queues moving forward, exciting. And then they shut the doors. We didn't get into that screening. I remember standing there for another couple of hours waiting for the next one. Uh, and, and then going in and seeing it, coming out. And, and I remember going home and that evening, my mum was getting ready to go out and I was sitting in her room on the end of her bed as she was getting ready and just telling her the story. But I mean, I don't think I left anything out. I literally went from scene to scene described the whole thing to it. It had that much of an impact on me. Uh, and, uh, and then of course Empire Strikes Back. And just before Jedi, um, at Elstree Studios, they had a big screening room, like a cinema in the studios where they used to screen the dailies uh, of the film. And uh, before we started working on, on Jedi, they screened Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back again for anybody who might not have seen it or anybody who wanted a refresher. And I remember going to see it uh, just because I could. Um, and, you know, those days there wasn't sort of DVD or anything or VHS, so you couldn't catch the <coughs> films once they were gone out of the theatres, you didn't see them again. So it was a good opportunity to go and see it. Uh, so, yeah, huge fan. I, mean, I remember walking on to the set of the Ewok Village the first day and, um, you know, coming face to face with, as I saw him, Luke Skywalker. It wasn't Mark Hamill, it was Luke Skywalker. And, and there's Han Solo and there's Princess Leia. He's after D2 and 3PO. I mean, it was... Absolutely mind blowing um, and uh, so, so exciting. And then, you know, for me as well, I, I kind of ignored the normal etiquette of, of keeping myself to myself because I was 11. I just did what I wanted to do and um, would wander over between takes and chat to, to Mark and Harrison and Carrie. And I don't think anybody had really ever done that on the films before. You know, they, they kind of enjoyed it, I hope. They didn't, they didn't shoot me away or anything. But, uh, uh, yeah, they were they were terrifically nice. You know, I, I still remember the toys that Mark Hamill got me, and I still have them at home. And Carrie Fisher worried about me in the Ewok costume. She would bring me milk and cookies and stuff. And yeah, it was really really terrific experience uh, for me. And um, yeah, one which I won't forget. And being part of Star Wars as an actor is is a is a is a really really cool thing. I mean, it's uh, it's something you're always going to be very proud of on your CV. There are other things I've done that I'm not necessarily quite so proud of, uh, but but Star Wars for me is the is the pinnacle, and it's something you know. You start with a film like Return of the Jedi, you know, and you're supposed to kind of slowly climb this ladder, but you start way up there, you know, your career could could look pretty shabby after if you're not careful. But I've been fortunate. There've been other other things that have, have kind of almost come to that to that level. But um, I think looking back, I'm most fond of of Wicket and, and the work that I did on, on Jedi, you know, and that could be with my start. What have we got time for? One more. For the Spanish, uh, uh, Star Wars Spanish stuff. Cool. Yeah. Hello. 
Uh, we are at page uh, about uh, collecting, and I would like to know uh, how did you feel the first time you saw a little figure, oh, and yes. it was you? It's very exciting, you know, as an actor when you get a figure for the first time, and uh, there indeed was a wicked figure. Many of them I've seen this weekend here at the, start, uh, at the event. Some people have got the very original ones from, from 1983. Um, and uh, yeah, it's exciting. Uh, and then they'll bring out a newer one. The new wicket was a bit more muscular. It's been sort of buffing up since the first time we saw it. Um, but yeah, I've got a nice little collection in my office of different, different figures. One of the most exciting occasions for me was when I became a Lego figure. When you become a Lego, because Lego for me, I grew up with that. And then to become part of Lego, and I actually hold a record, actually, as, as an actor who has the most minifigures. There are four minifigures of characters that I've played. So there's, there's Wicket, there's uh, a Goblin, Grip Hook minifigure, there is a Professor Flitwick minifigure, and now I'm going to forget the last minifigure. What's the fourth one? You'll have to look it up. There is four, anyway, <laughs> uh, trust me. There's one other actor that's got three. Harrison Ford's got two. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite pleased with that, so that particular honour. Uh, but yeah, and it's lovely to see what they release. You know, each year there's still things coming out of Wicket. There's little backpacks, lots of people got them. Little Wicket clinging onto the back. Um, there's just a, a whole myriad of things. And uh, it is amazing, isn't it, when you think of the films, how far away we are from their original release and how current the whole thing feels, you know, how they're still producing things. And there's still collectibles out there that are, you know, current and... Um, yeah, it's, it's astonishing, and uh, you know, I've worked on other franchises like Harry Potter. And are we still going to be celebrating them in 30 years in the same way as we are Star Wars? Uh, it remains to be seen. But, uh, but thank you very much for, for being here, everyone. It's, it's very nice to see you this early, and uh, thanks for supporting the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I might just mention, can I just mention my game that's coming out as well? Sure. Might as well plug something uh, while I'm here. But uh, a game called Pocket Warrior. Uh, which is going to be for smartphones, iOS and Android at this point. It comes out in October. And basically you have a little Warwick Davis living in your phone. You have to uh, look after him and uh, help develop his career. Uh, and it's, it's something that I've, I've produced the game, created the game, and uh, I'm quite excited about it. It'll be a free download. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to sort of point people towards the Facebook Pocket Warwick or the Twitter at Pocket Warwick, or go to my website and find out. What's the name of the app again? It's called Pocket Warwick. Pocket Warwick. Yeah, Pocket. So I should translate that by English. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Awesome. I'll be talking a little bit about it at the, uh, at the show today at 11.30. We've got some screenshots and I'll show a little bit of the game as well. I'm daring enough. But, uh, so. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey man. Yes. So you need to work.